we, uh, we have uh, arrived now at number 23 of uh, the contributions to this conference. Um, uh, we are glad to have uh, now here Mathieu Charbonneau uh, uh, with his uh, presentation. Uh, he is a PhD student uh, from Carleton University one of the few uh, sociologists uh, here at the conference. And uh, he'll tell us something about uh, uh, insurance. And the title uh, of his contribution is Towards a Political Economy of the Insurance Industry. That's your turn. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. Um, before starting, uh, I wish to thank the organizers for accepting me to, to give this talk uh, today. Um, Today I, I invite you to explore with me why capital as power approach offers, a, in my opinion, uh, on which one can study insurance capital mode of power and dynamics of accumulation. Um, as you will notice, since I'm just starting my second year of PhD, I will simply be offering an exploration into uh, this new empirical site for capital as power uh, approach. Um, interestingly, Outside of standard historical studies, orthodox economics, finance, and management, the insurance industry has been, in my opinion, again, highly neglected in social sciences and especially in political economy. Um, as a matter of fact, this neglect, this neglect sorry, might well uh, mirror the both the per pervasiveness of, the, of the, indus the industry as well as the opacity of this core institution of capitalism. So. Um, my agenda, I will start by offering brief remarks concerning some insights offered by regulationists uh, concerning uh, private insurance. But I will focus after that on the sociological controversy over the insurability of catastrophic risks. As uh, we will see, this analysis of an extreme form of insurance will uh, actually shed light on the case study of um, terrorism insurance. Um, and I will suggest that this controversy has allowed to establish an ideal type or, if you will, an archetype of insurability and thus to move beyond the strict uh, actuarial probabilistic notion of risks and insurance. Um, moreover, I will conclude by suggesting that the study of insurability points to uh, the possibility of approaching the political economy of the insurance industry through the uh, theory um, of capital as power since insurance capital's mode of power and dynamics of accumulation are based on essential state collaborations, on intense strategic sabotage, and on powerful creordering of society. So uh, let's start quickly. Um, as with most approaches, as I just said, in political economy and heterodox economics, regulation school has neglected to focus precisely on the insurance industry. Um, why do I talk about regulation school today? Because my opinion, and also in Bernard Chavance's view, regulation school intersects up to a certain point with institutional economics and thus with capital as power approach, although partly based on strong Marxist premises, as it offers a power-centered institutional approach. That being said, um, I found some insights on the interest industry uh, in the works of Robert Boyer and Francois Ch Chenet. First, uh, Boyi quickly mentions that the insurance industry greatly contributes to the liquidity of the interbanking system, and uh, in that way, private insurance ends appears to be at the core of both the monetary regime and credit system in capitalist economies. Um, as to Francois Chenet, uh, he traces back the origins of uh, financial capital centralization back to the 1950s, um, for him, financialization represents an indirect consequence of the capital accumulation that has occurred during the Golden Age period, or Fordism as they call it. Um, promoted by fiscal incentives, the richest among the uh, households of middle class and upper classes have started to use their extra saving mainly in order to buy life insurance and that before uh, the, 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 the rise in pension funds. Consequently, Consequently, even, and I, sorry, I quote uh, Chenet, consequently, even today, the insurance firms are the biggest owners of, of financial assets. And I add, in most industrialized economies, some of the most powerful institutional investors. 
Um, while they have been the leading actors in terms of, of assets volume, insurance firms are now being closely followed since the end of the 1990s by investment firms and uh, mutual funds and pension funds, which assets have been steadily growing at a faster rate. Um, okay, I will skip a little here. Um, concerning the regulation school, to, to sum up, the, the study of insurance industry represents a major gap in, in regulationist uh, literature, but uh, regulationist analysis nonetheless timidly point out to uh, private insurance as constituting a, a co the core of the globally dominant capital. So that being said, let's move to the controversy over the insurability of catastrophic risks, um, which I consider as the moment of birth of a, the sociology of insurance, which is an emerging field in sociology, but also as the, the first insights into a critical political economy uh, of private insurance. Um, just long story short, um, during my master's thesis, um, I became interested in the risk society theorist Ulrich Beck and, his, and in his private uninsurability principle. I will explain a little. Um, Formulated for the first time in 1992, Beck considers this principle as the institutional indicator of the shift from the industrial and national first modernity, as he called it, as he calls it, to the second uh, modernity of global risk society. That is not that interesting. What is interesting is that, according to him, and to this principle, the insurance industry would actually refuse to ensure global, irreversible, and unmeasurable catastrophic risks thus conflating all types of catastrophic risks like industrial, technological, even financial, and terrorism-related risks. It is precisely the case study of uh, terrorism risk insurance that has fueled this controversy between Beck and Richard Erickson. Erickson, sorry, former critical criminologist as at U of T, who passed away a few years ago, and Aaron Doyle, with whom I am working with at Carleton currently. But first and fo foremost, this debate has allowed sociology to tackle the issue of insurability by asking the simple question, what is insurable? So let's have a look at, uh, quickly at this debate. Um, but before doing that, just to some, some minor, uh, so, no, some important uh, uh, precisions. Um, private insurers, it is important to, to understand that private insurers are in the business of transforming uncertainty into risks by means of risk sharing, transferring, and spreading through the commodification and the securitization of risks, um, either of risks of death, disability, diseases, liabilities like medical malpractice, consumer product malfunction, car prescription drugs, etc., corporate governance in the case of directors and office, uh, offi officers' liability insurance, but also of accident, in whether industrial, technological, ecological, or risk related to landing, financial products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In that sense, I tend to believe that, uh, at least in principle, all risks are insurable, and uh, that the limits of private insurability are essentially, essentially defined both by the dynamics and uh, mechanisms of uh, capital accumulation, and by the political will to allow and design diverse state interventions, regulations, and collaborations. That being said, let's move to this um, case study of uh, terrorism risk insurance. It is extremely, in my mind, it, it is extremely illuminating. Um, since, uh, according to Erickson and Doyle, not only did the insurance industry's risk governance as enable uh, terrorism risk insurability before 9-11, but it also ensured it to re-expand after the facts in a context where insurers were facing, uh, let's say, a fear of the contraction of insurability, a dynamic analogous to the, the, the contraction of liquidity or credit crunch that has followed the 2008 crisis. Paradoxically, terrorism risk insurance markets produce enormous profits since loss probabilities are extremely low and contracts involve huge amounts of capital uh, stemming mainly from real estate. So I will show that this controversy has shed light on four ways in which the industry ensures terrorism risks insurability. One, precaution. Two, 
prevention, three, state collaboration, and then finance and securitization. And, and just to make myself clear, it is through this, this case study that I think that we can approach uh, uh, the, the insurance industry with uh, the capital as power theory. So concerning precaution, in a high degree of uncertainty, the insurance industry takes in consideration the preca precautionary principle, I always have trouble with this word, precautionary principle, in the construction of insurance knowledge and risk modeling. Thus, aside from actuarial techniques, insurers measure risks by virtue of any other useful form of knowledge one can think of, that is, history of terrorism, expert subjective opinions, common sense, speculations, etc. They uh, also started to include more seriously uh, the uh, worst case scenarios in their probable maximum loss models, as they call it. Secondly, preventive management of risks through security sur and surveillance technologies, as well as individual responsibility enforcement have increased. After 9-11, as Erickson and Doyle shows, show, insurers started imposing through insurance contracts and also through more informal ways, private security, surveillance technologies, and enhanced urban planning to their clients. In this way, insurers are transferring the cost of preventive risk management to the insured and to society. In other words, the industry thus promoted, among other things, individual responsibility. As Erickson and Doyle explains, and I quote, uh, the insurers affect moral regulation by making people think of risk subjects in terms of their own ethical conduct with respect to those objects, being knowledgeable about risks and doing their part to prevent, minimize, and distribute them. Third, um, for the industry, the state is not only a regulator, uh, but also a market maker and an insurer in last resort. So first, before 9-11, numerous private insurance policies against terrorism were already mandatory in some jurisdictions like New York, according to public compensation schemes regarding occupational accident. And since 9-11, insurers have, have, be, uh, have been legally constrained to reconfigure some conditions in terrorism risks insurance policies. Um, thus, in, indeed, um, this is why we can consider the state as not only the regulator, the market maker, but also um, the insurer in last resort. Because even though the, uh, in, in the case of a terrorist attack happening, the markets still have the confidence that the state will bail, get, uh, will bail out the industry anyway. Um, so finally, concerning um, Terrorism risk insurance, Erickson and Doyle also suggest that it is a story of how in condition of extreme uncertainty, insurance have difficulty forming a market and seek to help the government, sorry, and seek the help of governments uh, as, the insurance of the, as the insurer of last resort. In fact, the state creates insolvency funds, either with taxpayer money or industry contribution, depending on regulation in given jurisdiction. In this way, the state can prevent bankruptcies, or at least wants to prevent them, while at the same time increasing the limits of insurability. And this is the, the fundamental point. And finally, concerning the, the, the findings that, that came out of this controversy, the role of finance and securitization. Um, insurers can cover catastrophic risks by spreading highly uncertain risk through reinsurance and other derivative financial market and products. So after 9-11, insurers were facing the fear, as I said, of a contraction of insurability. Um, furthermore, the year 2001 was right in the aftermath of the dot-com bubble burst. So against the excess of uncertainty, the insurantial governance, however, developed two risk-spreading solutions, investing in financial markets and securitizing catastrophic risk in the reinsurance market, which, is, which are secondary insurance market. I will maybe focus on that later. Um, so on the one hand, Erickson and Doyle explained that the insurance industry addresses uncertainty by protecting capital from risk. Ironically, it does so by putting capital at risk, especially but not exclusively its own. End of quote. 
institution firms are indeed big speculators and they can go as far as putting their own solvency at risk. Interesting example uh, here is uh, the growth in um, earthquake insurance policies at the end of the 1990s in BC. <laughs> So based on the fear of, uh, of, uh, of a, uh, a earthquake that is produced by this cultural image of the West Coast and the, the, the American West Coast being prone to, to, to big earthquakes, the, the industry sold too much earthquakes that if an earthquake uh, actually happened, it would be unsolvent. This market, according to some um, experts, has uh, decreased since the, the, the beginning of the 2000s. So anyway, um, yes, on the other hand, finally, the uncertain and speculative risks are, thank you, being um, distributed in reinsurance market in order to increase risk spreading. In insurance mark in reinsurance markets, the originating or primary insurer takes out its own insurance protection with reinsurers in order to spread its risk exposure. Um, this financial sector, again, uh, has grown rapidly since the mid-1990s and parallels the evolution of other financial markets for der derivatives products in which, for instance, the subprime mortgages have been securitized and speculated upon by banks and speculative funds with the results that we all know. Um, as Philip Bougain, another uh, analyst, explains, um, the securitization of catastrophic risks, or CAD bond, as the industry called them, in the reinsurance and financial markets will involve, for the most part, participants with a mentality of investing over the shortest of time horizons, worrying if a single catastrophe, itself a phenomenon outside of their normal range of expertise, might occur. So, okay, I will show this, this figure. It's pretty murky, but it can help at least me, to understand what I'm doing. I hope it can help you. Now you get it, why I, I said it's murky. So basically, if you can understand, let's say three things, is the, the interrelations between the primary insurance market, that is insurance that, came, that comes from uh, individuals, households, collective institutional insurance, corporate, commercial, industrial in insurance. And then the primary insurers has to edge risks or invest, depending on how we want to put it, not only in reinsurance markets, but also in financial markets globally. First thing. Second thing, um, the important thing is the construction of risks that also differs. The, the closer you are, in my opinion, to primary insurance market, the more the construction of risks is based on actuarial and probabilistic knowledge. But the more you move towards financial markets, the more the construction of risks uh, uh, lies on, on financial and speculative uh, mechanisms. And thus, in my opinion, the liquidity of the insurance capital increase the closer, obviously, as you all know, you are from um, the financial markets. So that's about it. Yeah, maybe finally, the in the interesting thing that the, the, the sociologists and cr criti critical criminologists uh, has found through their uh, ethnographic studies is that insurance exert, as I uh, just explained, power in, uh, as governance outside the states through responsabilization, social control, security investigation, and this is interesting, they often employ former policemen to privately investigate the insured um, deceptive selling and fr uh, sales fraud. So that is this murky figure. So hence we could conclude that in its most basic or pure sense, insurability can be defined by one, the profit, the profit motive or the dynamics of capital accumulations. Two, the existence, the, the, the sole existence of a, of a legally recognized contract. And three, state regulations and collaborations. All that, and this is fundamental, without any systematic consideration for scientific risk knowledge. In other words, private insurance is in the business of fear and of judgment of probability, since radical epistemic uncertainty, not calculable risks, constitute its fundamental conditions of, of necessity. So, I um, still have a lot of time, but...
for, in order to conclude, but it's an open conclusion, obviously, um, two points. Um, as I just mentioned, interestingly, the first systematic, critical, and uh, let's say heterodox studies of private insurance have been produced by sociolegal studies interested in the gap between law in the books and uh, law in action, but also by critical criminologists and ethnographic institutional sociologists interested mainly in the relationship between power and knowledge and in white collar crime, fraud, deceptive selling. So for the most part, these per perspectives have approached, thank you, insurance as governance, that is, as a form of power beyond or outside the state, um, hence this strong Foucauldian influence. And two, finally, why capital has power, in my opinion, approach offers a solid foundation uh, for a political economy of the insurance industry. On the, on the one hand, in my view, qualities of insurance capital accumulation appear obvious thanks to those perspective, uh, mainly qualitative perspective, since we can suggest that the insurance industry use a lot of techniques to pre-order reality, as I mentioned through responsabilization of the individual, social control, private in investigators, um, the imposition of security and surveillance technology, as well as urban and infrastructure uh, design and planning. But also, and this is well uh, documented, the, insurance, the industry is characterized by uh, institutionalized strategic sabotage in the capitalist power uh, terminology. So first, <coughs> institutionalized market misconducts such as fraud and deceptive selling, mainly due to commission selling system, high labor uh, turnover rate, managers and agents capitalizing on their families and friends, all leads to, 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 to some forms of sabotage, but also I would suggest that there's a, another form of, of sabotage of insurantial mutuality and solidari solidarity, sorry, by means of demutualization and depooling of risks, I explain, by virtue of two techniques. First, risk classification, that is private insurers, in order to ensure profit, uh, differentiate their insured pools according to the level of risk in order to diversify premiums level and thus the, uh, the offer of different uh, products. And two, uh, they use risk deselection, that is the exclusion of certain consumer altogether. For instance, due to relative cost of property and car insurance in poor neighborhoods. So try to insure your car in uh, really uh, uh, poor neighborhoods where there is either speculated or objective high uh, rates of, uh, of robbery. Insurers will charge you more money. So, and on the other hand, finally, in a way, quantification through risk calculation and risk management uh, is at the core of, of the insurance capital's mo modes of power. In condition of radical epistemic uncertainty, in the Keynesian sense, actual probabilistic quantification appears as a powerful mode of legitimization in the ends of insurance capitals. Again, as we've seen, despite, any, despite a, a fundamental lack of scientific knowledge. But as you will probably uh, suggest, uh, answer to me. Measuring insurance capital's power, its capitalization, its dynamics of uh, differential accumulation, its ownership stu structure, and their historical evolution remains to be done. And I think I need some help, so that's why I'm here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Mathieu, for this interesting um, contribution. And thanks that I don't have to write uh, two minutes uh, warning. So we have a lot of time to discuss. Um, yes, questions, comments, remarks. Uh, thank you, Matt. And I think you outlined a lot of interesting qualitative aspects of, of how the insurance industry operates in, in ways that are, are sort of unexpected. Uh, I think it's important to document that what is sort of vernacularly understood as a, as a very conservative 
realm of the political economy in its relationships with securitization is really anything but and how it you know put lots of systems at risk um, I would suggest that this is all very ripe for quantitative analysis and I think documentation of the differential gains and losses of the insurance industry, its redistributions with other members of dominant capital, corresponding to you know, events global and local of, of all <coughs> manner, looking at the industry or the business in aggregate and, and disaggregate components of it, it would it greatly enrich uh, this a a account and I think Capital's Power offers a lot of really useful tools to do that. So I would encourage you to, to do that. And there are many people in this room who would be more than help, happy to help you, um, if you if you don't have those particular skills and they're quite easy to pick up. And if you do, I look forward to seeing where you where you might take that. Thank you. I prefer to answer. That was my answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Matt. I, I have a very brief question uh, that the answer might be long or short. In your view, is the insurance business, I use business rather than industry here, uh, how is it different from other forms of business? I was expecting you guys to tell me. Um, it, okay, first thing, the, the material uh, say manifestation of insurance is a piece of paper. Nowadays might not even be on paper. But still, it is a policy. It is, it is, a, uh, it is a promise of future uh, identity in case of accident, catastrophe, etc. So in that sense, it is not based on any productive imperatives, even though it is still uh, essential to any kind of productive uh, industries, by which I mean every business, every, every entrepreneur, every, every, every industry needs to, ins to buy insurance, not only households, not only uh, individuals, not only uh, institutions, other institutions. So it is, I think, the question. It is a really good question. M maybe I can follow up on that, given your answer. And perhaps you can think of insurance as a way of uh, conceptualizing the average. Because insurance deals with every possible business activity and, and increasingly with many different forms of life or aspects of life. And what it does is tries to characterize those aspects of life in order to eliminate the uncertainty or to reduce the uncertainty and replace it with the uh, uh, appearance of probability. So essentially, it, it creates uh, normal distributions or other forms of distributions wherever it can. It generates what, what society considers normal, and it generates the uh, tails of the distribution. So in a way, it, it is uh, an entry point for understanding the normal rate of return or normality in capitalism. And that's why I'm asking this question, because uh, it, it's interesting always to explore a particular sector, but it's doubly interesting if that particular sector actually is different from other sectors. Uh, so one way for you to uh, make, most, make more specific your, your analysis is to think what is unique about insurance, and you don't have to find 10 different things that are unique. It's enough to find one thing and to concentrate on that and see if you can actually tease out something really important, say, with respect to capitalization or with respect to the overarching perspective of power. Because one aspect of power is to try to look at the future and say the future is, is really unknown, but is not entirely unknowable, or at least we want to persuade ourselves that it's not entirely unknowable. So Keynes would would say, we can't say anything about the future that is definite because it's not like throwing the dice. We you cannot find out what the outcomes are going to be and you can certainly not assign probabilities to them. Well, that's exactly what the insurance business tries to do and tries to persu persuade itself and others that it can do it. And in the process, it, it mechanizes society. 
And I think that that's the most important thing, in my opinion, about insurance from the, from the moment go, you know, from London, uh, where they first tried to uh, estimate with statistics the population of London and things like that. It was always a power thing, and statistics come from the word state. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those questions, I think, feed in at the uh, sort of highest level of analysis into the, uh, uh, the notion of capitalist power, and maybe you can make use of this. Thank you. Okay, just since there was nobody else, uh, I just have a, a, a question. Um, this particular situation that you described, um, I know you said that you hadn't done the evolutionary or historical part, but uh, are you describing uh, the contemporary situation and, and uh, is that substantially different from even two or three decades ago? Uh, behind that question is, is this uh, what we're seeing here a function of deregulation? Or hasn't insurance in particular as a sector always been heavily involved in pre-ordering? Pre uh, that was... Uh, Those are really good questions, mm -hmm. and I will try to work hard to answer them. <laughs> Thank you very much. But in the future, you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 obviously. I'm sure you can make a, make a stab at it. My, since I'm new to 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 to, to this to capitalist power approach, my initial intuition is that. Um, as, as I just mentioned, the growth in, in, in um, the use of securitization by the industry is, has especially started since the mid-1990s, which is also in some, f for some regulationist analysis, uh, the, the, the consecration or the, mat the, 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 yeah, the, the beginning of the uh, true domination of finance capital in their, uh, in their words. So that, that leads me to think that it is, it has, um, transformed in line with other, uh, uh, let's say, uh, trend in financialization. Um, but as I said, for now, that's the only thing I can <laughs> can't answer. <laughs> for, for 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 instance, one empirical proof of that is the um, the emerging of secondary uh, markets for life insurance. So, uh, especially in the United States and UK. Um, some people are beginning to sell their life insurance identity to the insurance industry, which create, similarly to the credit uh, securitization, some secondary market for uh, securities on life insurance. So this is an, an, innov an innovation that, that appeared in the 1990s again, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I thought I've always thought that this is one area that really needs needs more research um, from a from a power perspective. Um, just connecting maybe to what Troy said earlier um, in terms of the empirics, and you might not have any idea about this. I'm just asking it out of curiosity. But first of all, who are the the main like maybe within the U.S. in terms of the the primary insurance market, and also, and this connects to the empirical question is that. Do you know if, um, in terms of the major players, if, if um, the trend towards conglomeration and amalgamation, if that's complicated things at all? Because I know if I go online and buy travel insurance, I buy it from RBC or from BMO. But there's, we know in, in the finance industry in general that a lot of people are now doing finance, right? Like Herman talked about GE doing GE Capital and, and having its own financial wing. So is that? Is the insurance market itself becoming conglomerated, and are there different supposed real real sector players that are now offering insurance and that type of thing? Okay, uh, interesting question. First problem uh, with the current empirical um, data we have is that it's mainly qualitative ethnographic research, which uh, imply anonymous uh, respondent and interviewee. So 
this is an important lab. Um, that being said, for instance, uh, I, I, I started to, to look a little bit deeper into the empirics of, let's say, AIG. And for instance, they have a big um, branch that is called International Losing for Aviation, or whatever the name of their branch, which is involved in aviation. So, so the, 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 the market for aviation insurance must be extremely huge. I don't have any figures that we had it. Um, and uh, maybe also, yeah, um, it is a uh, really concentra highly concentrated uh, sector. For instance, I think in Canada, 80% uh, of the market is controlled by five, maybe five uh, uh, conglomerates like that. Desjardins was the fifth. Yeah, obviously, you got Power Corp, which has Exxon. Anyway, so it is obviously a highly concentrated uh, market, which was one of the intuition I had when I was reading Capital Has Power. Um, but that's it, yeah, thank you for talking. Oh, more questions? We have time. Another possibility um, for the, the quantitative analysis is to look at the purchase of in, or the spending on insurance by corporations because it will often be listed in their various mm -hmm. reports how much they're spending on, on that in particular. And you could look at that spending, com compare it to what's going on in the insurance industry, and then the identifications of risks by those corporations because in their annual reports they very explicitly have to lay out what the potential future risks that they face are and I've always thought that that was an area that needed uh, a lot more uh, analysis. Thank you very much. So I have a question uh, myself. Um, uh, in your subtitle uh, there is uh, you write, between Weblenian institutionalism and the theory of regulation. You told us something about the latter, uh, but uh, how uh, will you Weblen bring in? Um, as I pointed out I, I, in my conclusion mainly, and this is also something that I was testing, how I can call these uh, institutionalized uh, Practices strategic sabotage as as capital as power understands it. I am not sure. So uh, deceptive uh, selling and fraud uh, commission syst uh, selling system, um, and I think those two those two um, uh, phenomena are really important. Uh, risk classification and risk deselection. So that that is how I was suggesting we could. Uh, look uh, at the uh, insurance business through uh, capitalized power approach. But I'm not sure if we can call that really strategic sabotage. That, th that's what I was suggesting. Because in a way, um, some an another hypothesis, working hypothesis for me is that there are some alternative legal forms of, of, of insurance like mutuals, which are often financial groups in reality. Uh, but still, there are some in more, say, democratic and, and uh, ethical forms of, of insurance uh, business and government insurance, so a comparative analysis of, of the corporate form and the alternative form might also um, help me to see if, the, 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 if there is truly strategic sabotage in terms of efficiency, risk classification, <coughs> solidarity. So. That's one way, and creordering also, since the insurance imposes its power through uh, various forms of governance, even um, and the uh, the works of uh, Ericsson and Doyle um, suggested that even the urban planning in Manhattan has been negotiated between states and the industry and uh, and the industry associations. So this is, my in my opinion, a form of creordering. That was my suggestion. So, any questions, comments left? Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.